a lot of DI leaders, because it was a flurry of kind of appointing DI leaders, particularly post the murder of George Floyd, Mm -hmm. a lot of DI leaders are figureheads. They have no influence. They're not positioned right. They're reporting into HR or to a very junior level. They don't have budgets. And I think, you know, I think that DI leaders need to start really assessing whether they want to take roles where there is no influence, where they're not positioned right. Um, and I, and it's beginning to happen because now they have choices, you know, and they can go from one organization to the other and really find the ones where, you know, this is there's more of a commitment and where, you know, sort of it's not just performative actions and that and that disruption of the status quo is becoming more of normal a normalized conversation in organizations. Yeah. Because giving money, adding DI positions is sort of an so easy t- thing. ticking ticking the box, right? They're exactly. Kind of like... And I think they need to talk more about that. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the HR Leaders Podcast. On today's episode, I'm joined by Rahini Anand, who's a former Chief Diversity Officer, Strategic DNI Advisor, speaker, and author of the new book, Leading Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion A Guide for Systemic Change in Multinational Organizations. During this episode, we discuss the five global principles that drive local diversity and inclusion change. We also talk about what DNI leaders don't talk about enough, but really should. And lastly, we talk about how you can move from situational action to sustainable progress. As always, before we jump into the video, make sure you hit that subscribe button now, turn on the notification bell, and follow on your favorite podcast platform. With that being said, let's jump in. Rohini, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. I'm very well, Chris. And how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's nice to see you. Um, I said to you before we went live that um, I've kind of... I've known you on LinkedIn. I've kind of stalked you on LinkedIn, your career <laughs> and, and, and everything you're doing. And, and here we are now. You're kind of on the other side doing some great work. You've obviously launched a new book. So how is everything? Doing very well. I mean, I, I didn't expect to be as busy as I am. So I'm trying very hard to pace myself and slow down. But uh, the book is doing well. I'm doing a lot of talks and podcasts and webinars. And the part that I love is also the nonprofit boards that I'm on. So I'm doing a lot of that, you know, because this is my opportunity to give back. So I'm doing a lot of coaching and sort of strategic advising, both of executive teams, but also of other chief diversity officers. I've done that informally my entire career. And now I'm doing it in a more structured way. I'm just, you know, very happy to be doing that as well. Amazing. I gave everyone a quick intro, but tell everyone a little bit more about your background and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, so I think, you know, for those that are involved in DEI, this is very personal as it is for me. And my story is absolutely integral to who I am. I actually grew up in Mumbai, India, Chris, where you know pretty much everyone looked like me in terms of skin tones with variations, of course. I belong to the majority religion, Hinduism. And surrounded by others like me, I had the privilege of not really having to think about my identity. You know, I was part of the majority. And my move to the United States as a young single woman to go to university was an inflection point, both literally and metaphorically. And my journey, you know, my identity shifted from being a person who pretty much saw herself as the center of her world to being a minority, to being an immigrant and to being a foreigner. And I was honestly completely unprepared for that. And, you know, it was when I was identified as a minority that I realized the privileges that come with being part of a majority. I was part of the majority growing up in India, but I hadn't recognized my privilege in that way. And honestly, I was unable to until I was perceived as a minority and I experienced things differently. So that's what brought me, my own personal experience brought me to the work that I do. And the realization that identity is situational, it's fluid, still informs my work. So You know, this work is very personal to me, understanding what it means to be perceived as an outsider, as a minority is at the heart of DI work. And my work is about leveling the playing field so everyone can succeed. And so I like to say that my vocation and my avocation are perfectly aligned. So this is sort of a 
you know, my, my journey to this work. And to be honest, you know, I, I started working at Sodexo, but I worked there for 18 years and, uh, you know, joined the company because I saw this was an opportunity for me to really have an impact. So let me just stop there. Yeah. So, so many things just jump into there. I'm interested to know, was that always the plan with the family that you would go to study, study in the U S was that always the plan from the beginning? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I think it was sort of, I don't think it was planned. So interestingly enough, my, my father studied in the United States in the 1940s and he came on a scholarship and basically got a film scholarship. Oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah, so, and, you know, he worked with the likes of Cary Grant and others and his first job out of film school in, in University of Southern California was in Hollywood. Oh, cool. So he had some amazing experiences and he came back to India for, you know, family obligations and reasons, you know, he traveled through the southern part of the United States in the 1940s and had his own share of, you know, discrimination based on his skin color. Did he speak to you about that, though? Did he say to you before you went, did he sit you down and say this, you know, you may, you know, kind of prepare you in any way? Uh he didn't. And, you know, in hindsight, you know, he, he would talk about it kind of tangentially, but he didn't kind of dwell on it. And in some ways, I'm glad he didn't, because he allowed me to kind of, you know, develop my own narrative, mm. right, my own, my own journey, my own narrative. So he did share, he shared a lot of very positive things. And, you know, I'm the one of three, three daughters, so I'm the oldest. And, um, you know, the expectation at that stage of life was really that, you know, I would go there and I would go to the United States, I would get my degree and I'd come back and, you know, have, get married and, you know, have a family and all of that. So he kind of wanted me to have that experience and encouraged me to go, but I don't think he kind of fully thought through what the repercussions <laughs> would be, which was, yeah. you know, that I would forge my own own path so. well, i think there's, there's there's positives to that though like you said it kind of you, you get you get to build your own path's experience build resilience yes. as well also you you don't you don't travel with your own backpack of beliefs and bias that's, it. that's exactly right as that's well, a good right? way to put it yeah. you don't, you you don't, don't yeah. i didn't carry my own backpack of you know his experiences yeah because you don't want to do that right is there is there a particular moment what would you say is like the first moment when you arrived that you realized that like was there like a particular moment something someone said or a certain situation when was was there a particular moment that you can remember that stands out to you um i'm not sure it was a particular moment um but it was a cumulative experience right so right from the time when i left you know i was part of you know the educated elite in the in india growing up and and moving to even just the flight you know we transitioned we transited out of london and the indian women that i saw in london for instance i mean they were they were very different experiences from from mine mm. um, and it was the same thing when i arrived first in canada and uh, you know there were indians in canada who had been there for multiple generations had come over as farmers and very different sort of experience base than mine. So it was those pieces and then how I was perceived, yeah. which really was, you know, because um, it, it, you know, I, I, it was people's perception of me that really started to kind of, you know, uh, land on me. And their perception of me was first based on my skin tone, based on, on my ethnicity, based on the experiences that they had had with others of my background and that started to kind of you know become a sort of a cumulative mm. experience for yeah me. so i want to jump into the book why did you write this book there's many books out there but what was the inspiration behind the book yeah i think that's a great question chris so you know when i rewired from sodexo where i work you know till 2020 january covid hit so i decided to hunker down and to write about my lived experience but honestly it was my way of giving back what i had acquired from the work that I had done to those that really continue to do the very challenging work of DI culture change, diversity, equity, and inclusion culture change. So for me, it was, it was an act of reflection. It was an act of closure. It was an act of giving back, sort of a legacy piece. But I also seen just how challenging it was whenever I presented at conferences, 
it was global diversity that got the most interest and the most frustration. And people really struggled with that. And there weren't any sort of practical practitioner books on that particular topic. Yeah. So it was my way to share my mistakes, my missteps. But also, Chris, the other piece was that, you know, progress in the space has been painfully slow. You know, after the murder of George Floyd, um, CEOs made a lot of sort of performative statements. There was, you know, in the U.S. alone, they gave $600 billion uh, for social justice causes. And a year later, I think it was about $200 uh, billion that had been spent, if I'm not mistaken. They hired chief diversity officers, et cetera. But, you know, it was really the struggle of how do you go from sustainable action, uh, from si situational actions to sustainable progress, especially globally. So this is not an academic book. It's not a theoretical book. It's a view from the trenches. You know, my way of sort of, you know, sharing my lessons learned. Experiences. Yeah. Well, I love the fact that it's part storytelling, but also actionable advice at the same time as well. Because again, it's coming from someone like yourself who's lived it, breathed it, <laughs> been in the yeah. fire and understanding that. Could you start by kind of going over the five global principles that you share? You talk about the, glive, the, the five global principles that drive local change, which I think is great sure. the way you framed yeah. it. Sorry. So yeah, you're, you're, you know, the five global principles. So, you know, given sort of the complex and the dynamic nature of global work, there's really no quick checklist or playbook and best practices are not enough. But every time I did this work, there were these five, as you mentioned, global principles that emerged that provides a sort of a through line. And each principle is a simple statement. Um, it includes sort of my experiences. They're simple, but they're disruptive. And they don't provide sort of standards or plug and play templates based on what's worked in the US. And honestly, that's been one of the foundational mistakes is to replicate what's worked in the US or in one part of the world in other parts of the world. But these principles can be applied with sensitivity to any sort of, you know, cultural context. And it allows sort of global leaders to really develop their own solutions and not mimic any one country's solution. So the first one is make it local. And, um, you know, there I really talk about the fact that change has to be anchored in an understanding of the local context, the history, the laws, the language, the culture, how identity is defined, how it's expressed power structures, the dominant subordinate groups, which differ, right? And understanding the context is honestly the first step in finding strategies to advance underrepresented populations locally. But the important thing is it does not mean accepting the status quo because outside influence can be a catalyst for change. You know, as an outsider, you can raise issues that those within a culture may not be able to because they're charged issues or power dynamics. But you really have to understand the culture and then work with local change agents to really push and, uh, you know, sort of disrupt the status quo and to find the right entry points and to ensure relevance. So how did you, you do know, that? Did you have like a, a, a business partner locally that you worked with? Who was leading that change? Because you obviously, as you mentioned, you worked at Sodexo, global brand. How did it work having teams on the ground? Who, 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 what was that structure? Yeah, so you, you, that's a good question. So I did have, you know, local, both local DEI change agents on the ground in the different parts of the world, but then also work with business partners and leaders, mm -hmm. you know, who really sort of internalized this and then executed against it. So it okay. was both. It was, you know, local partners who would, you know, I mean, in France, for instance, you know, gathering data on race is a taboo. Yeah. Right? yeah so, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Um, and you know that issues of race and racism are challenging, very, very challenging. And, you know, they're both universal and very highly specific. Mm -hmm. And every context has its own dominant and non-dominant group and, and they differ. So, you know, that racism is fluid and shaped by the history and culture. So you can't use a cookie cutter approach. And very often it's tangled up with issues with ethnicity or religion or caste, which take on more of a prominence than race. In the US, race is a driving social force. And elsewhere, race is just one of those several identities that divide and can pay, play maybe a less prominent role. Mm -hmm. So we expect racism to be expressed in a manner that we're familiar with. You know, we may is, miss some of those entry points, like, 
you know, discrimination against the lowest caste or religion, religious minorities in India or ethnic minority undertones in politics in Kenya, et cetera. So you have to have, you know, sort of local partners who help you to sort of navigate that um, and make right. it relevant. In, in Europe, one of the entry points was really working with refugees. You know, refugees come from ethnic minorities, religious minorities, and that became a way to really have this conversation about ethnicity. So it was, yeah, we, I did have, you know, local and identifying the right local change agents and partners is, is important. And, and maybe we can, you know, I can share an example later about, you know, a leader who actually disrupted, you know. How um, do you identify them? Because I'm sure people listening is like, great, but how do you identify those change agents? Right. So I think, you know, that's sort of a, uh, that's a tricky piece, right? So because you really, very often people go to just those folks that are the most vocal. But I do think you have to uh, have a nuanced understanding of the of the, the dynamics within an organization and not just go to the senior most person who doesn't understand what, you know, what the um, uh, experiences of, of the workforce are. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it comes from really, you know, if you have someone that you trust who can help you to navigate the space and share with you what the power dynamics are, that helps then in finding out who those change agents okay. are. And sometimes it may be the people who are the most resistant. So, you know. Yeah. So the second principle is leaders change to lead change. And we know that, you know, for this work, you know, senior leadership and their commitment is absolutely fundamental. But when leaders embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion with purpose and passion, organizations can really go from that performative action to sustainable progress. But to do that, they've got to internalize the benefit of DEI to themselves. And this sometimes takes a disruption of their worldview and very painful process, very often of introspection. You know, and sometimes it's stories and experiences and not data that helps to get them there. And I've, you know, brought leaders along on this journey from a place of resistance to a place of really being, you know, the aha moment and saying that, yes, this is important, um, you know, to them. So, so to get to transformative leaders, they really have to combine this sort of inclusive mindset and behaviors with concrete specific action, because personal behavior is what demonstrates a conviction, but it's those actions that signal a commitment. Could you give me so, an example of something of that? Yeah, so the example that I will share with you is um, good question. So yeah, the the one and you know a lot of the CEOs sort of you know got to that point. But the example that I'll share is you know the the, the actions that they take in terms of how they position DI, how they hold their teams accountable. Okay. So the one big example that I'll share is one of the CEOs, Michelle Londell. He actually had an incentive linked to diversity objective. So, mm -hmm. you know, there was a bonus link. But what he did was he went a step further and he said, I'm gonna decouple that from the financial performance of the company. So what that meant was even if the company didn't do perform well financially, that diversity bonus was still paid out if you met your diversity objectives. Now that sent a powerful yeah. message to the organization that we're in this for the long haul. It's not about the, you know, the ebbs and flows of the business, but this is important. So that's a clear action that demonstrates commitment, that. that demonstrates com com conviction. So mm -hmm. they've got to lead it like prioritize DI like you would any other business objective, right? Yeah. The third principle is and of good business do, and that's pretty clear that without a compelling reason for change, 70% of change efforts will fail. But diversity, equity, and inclusion can't be siloed or bolted on. It has to be congruent with the organization's purpose and how business is done. So, you know, you've really got to embed it within, you know, within the, 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 the sort of context of the business. It's not a check the box, a side thing. It's part of day-to-day -day business. The fourth is go deep, wide in, inside out. And organizations are comprised of interconnected systems that work in concert with each other. And DI is to be infused into the processes, the structures and the systems, both internally and externally. And the last one is know what matters and count it because you know metrics provide this framework and a yeah. cohesive narrative, but you really got to have the right metrics and hold your teams accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think all of those things kind of working in concert with each other uh, are absolutely critical. Those are the four principles that I have found very yeah, great. critical. 
I, I know I love those and uh, like you said it's you're providing those but there's the freedom in the framework where it may if different things make sense depending on your context the Absolutely. country your organization yeah. the structure etc there's no cookie cutter approach that is like you said earlier one of the biggest mistakes that you've seen the companies make um, yeah. as well what would you say would yeah. be some of the other common mistakes that you see organizations make yeah, and I think one of those is sort of assessing situations with a limited, you know, monocultural worldview. Um, and I can share my own experience with you, Chris, on that. You know, monocultural worldview and sort of imposing experiences from one part of the world on the other part of the world. So when I went to India to do DI work with Sodexo, you know, I had grown up in India. I, you know, thought I knew everything about <laughs> India. I went uh, to India and I was in this room full of about... 20 women entry-level managers. And I was there to talk to them about advancing their careers. And I went off on, you know, talking about leadership development and talking about mentoring and how wonderful it is. And it was just this pin drop silence in the room. And um, you know, clearly I wasn't connecting with them. Um, but so I backed up and I said, well, you know, let, uh, help me understand how you know, the organization can support your career advancement. What gets in the way? What are some of the barriers? And one of the women kind of very gingerly raised her hand and she said, you know, we live in joint families, multi-generational joint families. And when I finish work, I can't stay late at work because I have to go home. I have to take care of the dinner. I have to take care of my in-laws because we live with our in-laws and my husband's siblings. And I'm expected to do all of that work. And I was like, you know, I had completely forgotten the multi-generational joint family dynamic in India. You know, I was looking and at And that's the majority, this. right? Even in London, that's still the same with my friends um, as well. Yeah, it, it, it tends to be, you know, for a variety of reasons, that's mm -hmm. sort of the structure very often. Um, where, the, you know, where couples live with the husband's extended family and the daughter-in-law is expected to take care of all yeah. the housework. So, and I had forgotten, Chris, the role of the Indian woman, not just as a mother and a wife, but also a daughter-in-law. And, mm. you know, I'd forgotten my own sort of limitations as this multidimensional being, because I focused on one aspect of my shared identity with these women, which was, you know, the fact that we were Indian. Yeah. So one of those early lessons that I learned was it's really not useful to export initiatives that have worked at home to other parts of the world. And that I, you know, this temptation to assume that I understood a place without checking my presumptions. And that's a, a mistake that a lot of, you know, individuals doing global work actually make. Um, yeah. And I think we need to be careful, mindful of that. So that's well, just one example. I'd love to know what some of the reflections are of you writing the book. Like I've interviewed a lot of authors and they feel like they always tell me that, Chris, I learned so much about myself when I write this book, because you're kind of putting it all down on paper, right? What was, was there any aha moments of writing the book when you wrote, when you kind of finally put it all down on paper? Yeah, I think a big, there were a lot of insights because, you know, I learned a lot about myself. And I think one of the things, the DEI practitioners like myself, we're involved in sort of these large scale efforts to change people's behaviors and mindsets and retool systems. And yet we frequently approach the work with our own limited worldviews that are very antithetical to the very outcomes that we're seeking. Um, you know, so that was one thing that, you know, I, I sort of realized about myself. And the other piece is, you know, that I, all, I have my own blinders. I'm constantly learning. Um, and when I started unpacking some of these things, I realized, gosh, you know, there's so many sort of missteps that I had made and yet I'm expecting sort of others to kind of <laughs> lean into this right um, and the other piece is you know this whole thing about imposing experiences at work on one in one part of the world onto a different part of the world it sort of risks kind of replicating those very sort of dynamics <laughs> mm -hmm. you know uh, of uh, dominant countries right you're so doing you're kind of I, doing what you're the exact opposite of what you're trying to exactly, achieve <laughs> exactly exactly and the other piece is also you know having passion for this work is wonderful and we all approach it with passion but sometimes we get locked into that passion and i know that for myself and for many others particularly doing this work in the u.s 
um, you know, we approach the work with a civil minds mindset, and that is does not work. It does not translate. And I think we just have to be very careful. I, I, you know, I work for a French company, right? So in France, it's forbidden to gather data on race and ethnicity, yeah, yeah. unlike in the UK or elsewhere, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And race was actually removed from the constitution in 2018. And this was in response to the persecution of Jewish people and an effort to rebuild France after World War II, they decided to redefine themselves as indivisible, which meant that they wouldn't identify people by community affiliation, but rather by a sort of objective criteria like migration or citizenship, so that the state couldn't use identity data for state action. So now that was the context, but I could see that entry in entry level positions, you had a lot of black people, but in management, you know, barely a sprinkling. So there was an issue, right? So how do you sort of navigate this work? And I'm coming with my, you know, sort of civil rights mindset and I'm kind of, you know, I see this and this happens with a lot of my colleagues as well. They say, well, there is, and you know, but how do you have this dialogue in a country where, you know, race is not something that, that is explicit, that has been actually removed and you cannot gather data. So how do you have this conversation with them? And, you know, as one person I interviewed for my book said to me, she said, you know, there are two dreams. The U.S. has one dream on this topic and France has a different dream, dream on this topic. They mm. approach it in very different ways. So one of the ways that I found was to actually, you know, approach it through this issue of, of integration of refugees, um, you know, because that started to get the the conversation going. Now, obviously in light of Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement, things had, there is an opening to have more of this conversation, but you've got to sort of, you know, understand the context you're working with. Just to come at it for a different angle, for a different lens. So, and that's going, probably going to be the same for every different countries. Exactly. Um, and, and, exactly. and again, that, there's no easy way to do that, is there really? It's just no, there's no way you can do that apart from having the conversations and taking time to understand. Can I, can I share a quick story with you on that? Yeah, Chris? go for it. Yeah. So, um, one of the CEOs who was at Serexo, um, I was reporting into him, and you know we were focused on gender globally, and he said to me at one point when I started talking about race and ethnicity, he said, "Why are you diluting the focus on gender by you know talking about all these other dimensions?" And I realized that I really had to, you know, bring him along and really give him an, a sense of what it means and that identity is intersectional and you can't just be a woman, you know, there's intersectional, like, I'm a woman, I'm also an Asian woman, I'm a mother, mm -hmm. and, you know, so there's intersectionality in your identity. Um, I, and also sort of give him a sense of sort of the importance of race, particularly in, in, in the United States. So I invited him to an ERG meeting in the United States, uh, African-American ERG meeting, mm -hmm. employee resource group meeting. And he was one of the only white men at that meeting. He was one of the only French men at that meeting. And they had these two breakouts, um, the, the employee resource group. One was a barber shop and the other was a beauty parlor. And for <laughs> cultural context. Love, yeah, you know, that's where the conversations happen, yeah. <laughs> where all the conversations happen. Love exactly. it, that's cool. Exactly. So he sat in the barber shop <laughs> and he listened to the lived experiences of the black men. Mm. And he came to me afterwards completely, you know, I mean, he was, it was very disruptive for him. And he, because it had come close to home. These were leaders that he knew and they were sharing their experiences of what it meant to be a black man. And then his own experience of being a minority and the two together um, you know, he then went on to send this really heartfelt message um, after George Floyd was murdered to the organization, which he never would have done had he not had this experience. He actually went on then to take his entire team to, it, to Atlanta. He had a meeting behind the scenes meeting at the um, Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta. And they got a behind the scenes tour of the museum, which was very, very moving for them. Um, so, he, you know, said, and then the other thing he did was during succession planning meetings, he would not only say, you know, who are the women who are successors, but he would also ask for nationality. He would also talk about race, which 
would not have happened before. Love it. So, yeah. It's those lived experiences, right? You can talk about it all of all the, all you want, but put it, but him being in that location, you know, and, and, and in that environment is you know, it's, you got the heart and the mind. Exactly right. You know? and yeah. and you're you hearing the know. stories of people. Um, as well, I love that example. I love that example. What would you say um, now? You're no longer there's you know there's a certain level of transparency you can give when you're a practitioner in the role. Now yeah. being on the other end, you can be a bit more freely about what you can say. <laughs> and yeah. one of the questions I love to, I love to ask you is, what are what's something what are some what's the main thing you think HR uh, DEI leaders don't talk about enough, but they should. Hmm. What do they not talk about enough, but they should? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say one of the things is that you know a lot of a lot of DI leaders because of this flurry of kind of appointing DI leaders, particularly post the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. a lot of DI leaders are figureheads. They have no influence. They're not positioned right. They're reporting into HR or to a very junior level. They don't have budgets. And I think, you know, I think that DI leaders need to start really assessing whether they want to take roles where there is no influence, where they're not positioned right. Um, and, I, and it's beginning to happen because now they have choices, you know, and they can go from one organization to the other and really find the ones where, you know, this is, there's more of a commitment and where, you know, sort of, it's not just performative actions and that, and that disruption of the status quo is becoming more of normal, a normalized conversation in organization. Yeah. Because giving money, adding DI positions is sort of an so easy thing. Ticking, ticking the box, right? It's exactly. Kind of like, and I think they need to talk more about that. How Definitely. do you, how would you, if you were going into a company tomorrow, what are some of the questions or things that you're look, you would be looking for to know that that organization truly is committed what were some of the things that if you were in that interview of that CEO, what would you be asking as a former chief diversity officer to know that this is the right company for me? Well, first of all, you know, making sure that the CEO does have a conversation with you. That's so a, that that's a, good, <laughs> that's that's a good, good start. Right? I, I just assumed that would be, that's a good, good point. No, but <laughs> well, that's the first step because not often does the CEO have a conversation with you, having that conversation with the CEO and, and trying to understand, you know, what's in it for them. You know, why are they doing this? Is it just a legal mandate? Is it just, you know, a response? Is it, is it pressure? They, so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it pressure? Is it, you know, investor pressure? Is it, you know, a crisis in the organization? Or is it something a little, you know, more genuine and deeper that they actually believe that the organization can benefit, that the business can benefit, that they can get the best and brightest talent as a result of it? that their business can grow as a result of it. That's what you need to really assess. You know, what is, you know, why are you doing this? That's something I would ask, you know, what's behind your wanting to hire a chief diversity officer or a diversity professional, mm -hmm. you know, Love what that. is your vision and what's your vision? But the number one thing is, you know, get an audience with the CEO. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I love asking them, what is their vision? Because <laughs> they're not probably not going to be prepared for that if it's not genuine they're not going to be that's prepared. right <laughs> they're not going to be prepared yeah. for that have you ever been in a position where you've interviewed for a role and you've and you've actually had that experience yeah. where you're like actually this isn't the right role for me yeah i have um i definitely have you know i've sort of you know i've even walked into organizations and just the sort of <laughs> the cues that you get from who's at you know, who's at senior level. And oh, you can see it, right? Literally. <laughs> yeah. It's the visual cues that you get. But yeah, I have. I've, I've, yeah. I haven't, I haven't interviewed that many times because I've, you You've know, been there so I've long. Been one place yeah. For yeah. Eight. yeah so. Listen, before I let you go, thank I, I, I wish we, could, we need to do a part two because I've got so many more questions here <laughs> uh, yeah. as well. But where, where can people grab a copy of the book and where can they reach you? If they want to come reach you directly, where can they reach you? Yeah, so you can reach me on my website, www.rohiniyanand.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. And you can order my book through Amazon, through any of your local booksellers. Um, it's actually being published in India uh, with Penguin Random House. You know, all Amazing. the books have it. And so, yeah, happy about that. It's in paperback in India. Um, 
And um, and you got the audio book yeah. too. I, I have an audio book, which I thought I, was really cool. Um, yeah. Love that. And and the audio book is actually read by um, someone whose pronoun is they, and uh, um, they are Canadian of Indian origin. So uh, I'm very happy about that as well. Yeah, as you gotta be intentional. And at the very last thing, what would be your advice for the DEI leaders of tomorrow? Your parting advice. So my parting advice is honestly that, that any of this transformation happens at the intersection of people and processes of the personal and systemic. It's work that's ongoing, but it has to be a personal and a professional journey for each of us. And every one of us can use ourselves, you know, examine our self-awareness and inclusive behaviors and actions and use ourselves as instruments of change. So my parting advice would be that it's difficult work, challenging work, but incredibly gratifying work. And thank you for what you're doing. Amazing. Well, look, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Everyone listening, go grab a copy of the book. If uh, wh whatever platform you're listening on right now, there'll be a link below the book. Uh, also go and connect with Rahina on LinkedIn. I think you should connect there as well. So we'll also put a link to your LinkedIn below. But apart from that, I wish you all the best and look forward to doing this again soon. Thanks, Chris. It was wonderful. And good luck to you as well. Thanks for what you're doing to amplify this topic. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.